My name is David Rowland, and I'm excited to be moderating a virtual conversation with director Boaz Goldberg from the movie Tomorrow's Gone, which is premiering at this year's festival. Thank you all for joining us. So Boaz, I'd like to start at the beginning. Um, as people who have watched the movie know, you, you started filming this 20 years ago. Can you go over the timeline of, of the making of this film? Um, well, at first, actually, Charlie, I mean, uh, was a really good friend of mine. So in, in a way, it's like um, a vice versa or the other way around of the story that, you know, you, um, uh, you, you have a, a rock and roll cult hero and you want to be friends with. With Charlie, I was... I mean, I was uh, his best friend at first. And actually, in those times, um, we actually um, played together. And after we, uh, a short period of playing together, he was like sort of um, a, really, a, a really strong influence uh, for me psychologically, like to help me through things in life, like to, um, to achieve myself as an artist. Because I had a little bit of stage fright back then. And the um, time went on. Um, I actually stopped at one point and uh, he became what he became. Um, I, I, made a, I made a comeback and uh, shot again. Um, and we had many phases of, you know, um, cutouts like in and out, in and out. And in the film, I'm in and out of the story as well. Um, until, you know, the tragedy struck. And, um, and then everything, uh, everything actually, actually that's when, that's when the, that's when I went from like uh, first gear into fifth gear. If you know and how much footage did you shoot over the years? Well, you know, usually in, in film schools, they teach you that you have to shoot like about um, one hour per one minute. But actually, you know, in art, you can do it every way. I mean, you don't have to. Um, uh, each each uh, film has its own, you know, unique unique uh, vibe and unique um, like breath. So um, in the early, uh, in the early always, I shot about I think six hours or so. And then I had like another six hours or so over the years. Yeah, something like that. But I think that the fact that we were, we were already good friends, um, so Charlie uh, sat down for our interview, you know, which is the main like spine of the movie. He sat down and it was like a very, very intimate talk, closed talk, you know. So actually this thing became the, the boulevard of the, of the film actually. Without that interview, I, I, you know, it would be very different. And how, how famous was he in Israel? I saw, you know, in the movie, you see him on TV shows. Was he, was he sort of a celebrity or was he kind of like a cult figure? I think definitely, you know, more like the cult figure. Um, it, you know, the, the, the mainstream, although, although you, you know, you got like hipsters nowadays in the mainstream and stuff, but he was something else. He wasn't... Uh, he wasn't an hipster. He was sort of an, an alien in, in many ways. Um, so the mainstream wasn't really, re and, and he wasn't really, you know, he didn't really want to be there. Uh, he took this thing as a um, sort of a, like I show in the film, sort of as, you know, spiritual exercise to, to live better, you know. And as, as a music journalist yourself, I, I don't know how familiar you are with American music. Is there sort of a, a figure in America you could compare Charlie to a little bit? Well, you know, the main, the, the, the first name you, you comes, to, comes to, to your head is Elvis Presley, you know, <laughs> actually. But 
in in reality, I mean, in Elvis was like a major shadow uh, on his life, um, you know, for so many years. I mean, from 15 till his death, something like that. You know, he always would think, what would Elvis do or what would Elvis say? Or uh, And he had many strange observations about Elvis. But actually, in real life, um, his persona was more like... Um, you know, a juvenile delinquent, uh, something like um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm like, like Gene Vincent in the beginning, something like that, you know, a really mean rockabilly, um, very free, very wild. It was quite amazing that, you know, I think that his um, best um, era was the USA years the, the the you know it was a year before he died something like that and he lived for nine months in the what I call the the long tour like you know the lost tour <laughs> he lived for nine months in North Carolina and you know you think that um, someone from Israel wouldn't be so um authentic rock and roll, American rock and roll. But actually, you know, it was like, instead of doing what most Israelis do when they come to the USA is to sell ice to the Eskimos, you know, he sold gold, you know, to the Americans, I think. And it's quite amazing. And it happened in, from, um, from, you know, from different reasons. Also, the, the fact that he came from, um, you know, the rural north of Israel. He came from a Moroccan immigrant's uh, family. Um, so he had something of that, I think, um, um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying to find the world, the word, but sort of that, um, you know, outsider look on, on society. Like, um, like you have in the, in the blues, the American blues. And it, you're talking about his uh, American time. And I, I was shocked, you know, I'm watching this for the Miami Jewish Film Festival. I was shocked, you know, midway through the movie, you see he's playing a show at Gramps, a bar here in Miami. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I looked it up because I was curious, oh, when was this? And I saw the first thing that came up on Google was a Facebook post from a photographer of a newspaper I, I wrote. He, he shot the show at Gramps here in Miami. And he wrote, um, it is June 26, 2015. Jim Hall said, this was his first time in Miami. It was easily one of the best live shows I've ever seen or heard. Everyone there was lucky to get to see him perform. How, how did his time in America, um, I assume you talked to him after that, Lost tour. How how did his time in America did it affect him at all? Did it influence him at all? I, I actually I wasn't in. We we didn't talk in all these Berlin years and uh, times in America. Um, and only after you know what happened, you know after he died, um, I watched so many footage of those times in America, and then I I I just understood that. The America years of Charlie Magira was his best era because he had to like, you know, go all this journey of many, many phases that he had, you know, doing all this trash punk, dark wave, all these things um, into, in the America years, he went back to his roots again, into his very early years as Charlie Magira doing it, you know, like back to rockabilly and back to minimalism. And it was, and he did it so good, you know, with um, the drummer, um, he's the drummer of, um, uh, his name is uh, Wills, uh, something Wills, sorry, was the drummer of the Raining Sound. The Raining Sound, they're uh, a very good, cool um, Southern rock Americans. Okay. Yeah. So his, his American ears were really like he had, like it, it, it was the pinnacle, I think, of his project. 
And, and in Israel, though, was, was uh, I mean, when, when he passed away, what, what was the reaction like? Was it, was it, a, did he become more known after that? Or was it, was there a lot of mourning? Uh... Yeah, yeah. He, he, um, you can definitely say that he became more known after that, although he was a cult figure. The reaction was totally, total shock. Yeah. Um, a total shock. Um, and no one could really see it coming, apparently, you know. Um, he was, he was a, an extremely fra fragile, you know, soul, a human being. But uh, uh, we thought that everything is really going up. <laughs> but, you know, uh, like his music and his project, I mean, art project, he he, he he done it, you know, he uh, he has a, a, such a unique story, you know, till the end. So you can't be really surprised that it's happened. And, and, and working on this, editing this movie after his passing, was that, was that very difficult for you as a friend of his? No, actually, but it was like, it, it was a big fulfillment for me, like as an artist, you know, doing my debut with this stuff after, you know, it's the same person that really, um, uh, that really pushed me back then to do stuff. Um, but it's, it was also, you know, like, um, like a heritage that I have to, to put out. I mean, like sort of, you know, Megira in Hebrew, one of the meanings of Megira in Hebrew is drawer, a drawer. Sure. Yeah. So it's like, you know, uh, Charlie Megi Megira, Megira was also like some kind of a joke, a thong in cheek. One of the, that like it's, he writes for, a, for the drawer. <laughs> uh, yeah, at first. But, um, so I couldn't think of, do, you know, put, um, keeping it in the drawer um, again. I mean, it was a big, um, it, I really knew it that this time it's gonna, it's gonna happen. And maybe, you know, as a music journalist yourself, you, you can uh, kind of describe, you, you, go, you go into it a little bit in the movie, but can you, kind of paint a picture of us, for us, what the uh, Israeli rock scene was like that he came out of, that you were part of? Um, yeah, actually the 90s were, the 90s had a big explosion of, of bands. You know, after in the 80s, it was more, you can say that it, it was more like things like, uh, some of them were international, minimal compact or, uh, in the 80s, it was more like club oriented, you know, and high energy um, um, electro stuff. But in the 90s, it was like rock is back again. And um, we actually did have a very, very small grunge scene and very, very small mod scene and a very small Britpop scene and all those kinds of things and noise and stuff, noise rock. but. Charlie Megira was really, really like, um, like an alien, even to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, because, you know, I mean, he really, he was really influenced by the Smiths and, the, and Morrison and, the, and Johnny Marr. But still, you know, the fact that he, he was so out of time in his looks and in his mind, um, it made him, uh, yeah, sort of an alien, even back then in the 90s. Um, so his first band, the Schneck, um, was a very small band. It was like a tiny, tiny band. Um, and, you know, a very, very uh, amazing tiny band because, <laughs> you know, their, their first show was like a bar fight. <laughs> their first show because yeah because like um like soldiers on vacation or something 
shout, like, you know, made laugh of, of them or something. So not Charlie and Nathan, the lead singer was like, went on to fight them. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. And Charlie had like a show, in the, like I say in the movie, he had like someone put a beer into his head. Yeah. <laughs> That was the first show. But then the Charlie McGeera, after many, after like five or six years, came to this figure of Charlie McGeera. And, and at first he was very more on the shy side, you know, the gentle shy side. It was only then that it was Michal came, Michal Kahan, and there was like, Charlie McGeera became sort of a Sid and, Sid and Nancy version, you know, <laughs> afterwards. And then he built, he built this um, persona, you know, that uh, was really in and out of Gabi, too. And as far as his music, I, I saw there's seven albums. I, I just saw the movie yesterday, so I haven't had time to dig through them which I'm looking forward to. Where, where do you recommend, which album do you recommend people start uh, to get a listen, to get a good feel for him? Um, I, I think that the first album, the first one, um, the first one is, is to those kind of albums that uh, make your body warm, you know? It, it happens that the temperature it's, it, it happened to me like when I was uh, 14 and I listened for the first time to uh, the Metcap Laughs by Sid Barrett, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. So, um, and then try um, Rock and Roll Fragments, which is also, um, it, it, it's very rockabilly, but it's more fragmental. And I think the film actually is... Um, is a homage to, to Charlie Megira also in his um, perception of how to how to saw things, you know, because um, it's uh, a bit fragmental, uh, a little bit. I mean, you don't see the, um, you know, uh, usual uh, talking heads that are saying he was like that, he was like that. Um, I built it um, with, I, I try to build it uh, with the Charlie McGeera idea that every every art form every art form has its own uh, breath, like own special breath, you know, without um, not to be convention, not not to put things into conventions, you know. Uh, it's funny to say that from the Charlie, because um, Charlie, in a way. He wanted to put things into conventions, you know, but it, it deliberately, like like to be this Elvis fifties figure, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, he had very like new age spiritualistic uh, ideas about uh, you know being uh, being sort of um, he called it um, a controlled clown. Controlled clown, yeah. That people would think that you're, you don't have a plan, but actually you have a plan to escape. <laughs> sort of. Yeah, and like, like you were saying, um, you know, there's no talking heads in the documentary. There's, uh, it's you and him pretty much only talking. I think his brother is off camera and, and he says something. Were, were there kind of movies that influenced you? There were there kind of documentaries that kind of influenced this? Uh, yeah, it's it's a good question because actually, um, I didn't really have a, a role a role model film. No, um, I just knew that uh, um, that I don't have a choice but to to, to do it. You know, um, really emotional and personal with my voiceover because it was like sort of um, a, rec a requiem uh, for, for friendship and for, you know, um, the scene in Israel. And I think, if I may, that, you know, the, the death of Charlie McGeever sort of symbolizes the, 
you know, the situation of rock and roll nowadays. <laughs> yeah, and, and and for your, as a lot of it is your narration, a lot of the movie, maybe, what was your process in writing that narration? What was your, I mean, it's in Hebrew, obviously, we get the subtitled version, but how, how do you go about writing uh, what what we hear you say in the movie? So, yeah, it, it was a process and it was um, a challenge and the thing is that I worked many years in television and, you know, in television, 99% um, of the time, you know, you work on small pieces like three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes tops. So you first write the, vo the, the, the text and then you um, adjust visuals to the text, you know, and then it works out like uh, faster too. Um, when I started to uh, editing Tomorrow's Gone, I, uh, the first few days, that's what I did. And then I realized that I'm like a slave to the word and the movie will never be, uh, it, we, we didn't, wouldn't have a drive this way. So I deleted everything and, um, I turned off my, my, um, my speakers even. And I said that I will build the movie just um, at first, like with things that, you know, are maintaining. And in between the Charlie way, I, I, um, I felt that in, in, uh, in some places, I, w I, I had to make a voiceover. And I saved the, that voiceover for the last, uh, I knew there were like holes. I knew that there will be a voiceover here, but actually that was the last thing that was uh, done in the film, the voiceover. When I filled the holes with voiceover, yeah. So instead of doing the first thing, like in television, I did it the, la the last thing. So I, I, I I really try to make the film as a musical se sequence that is pure musical, you know, and not not which would be a slave to the word. I think it you have this uh, sort of a path that the film goes. Um, also, I, I I recorded some stuff for the film, like about fifteen percent of what you hear is fillers of me and stuff. Um, that try to really, I mean, produce the best of Charlie, I think. Um, from what he, you know, from his amazing career. And it, has this movie aired in Israel yet? Have, have, has it streamed yes, it yet? Had. Yeah, yeah, of course it had. And yeah, yeah. Actually, it, it, it was out in um, May two, uh, 2019. Okay, so before yeah. COVID. Okay, yeah, yeah. so has it has it uh, increased his reputation in Israel? Is is he is his music better known now? Or if you ask if you ask me, well, uh, to be ob objective, you really yeah, it, it has. <laughs> but also also um, Numera Group, the the prestige label, had um, put out um, six months after the film came. Uh, uh, amazing a compilation, double album and vinyl, amazing compilation of Charlie McGeera that is called Tomorrow's Gone, by the way. Oh, excellent, excellent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, because it reminds me of, and, ho and hopefully it does it for him, uh, it, it reminds me of, uh, you know, the devil and Daniel Johnston and the searching for Sugar Man, you know, an artist, you know, a lot of people don't know. Um, hopefully it opens up a whole new uh, audience for his music. Actually, it's it's really uh, crazy. I get emails from really all over the world, really, um, from all over the continents that uh, where can I watch the film? Um, I, they say that they heard Charlie McGeer and, be, and became and became obsessed an obsession, really. Wow. And also, you have many like celebrities that I think uh, into Charlie. Um, uh, Stuart, uh, what was his name from the Black Keys, Mordor, and um, Jack Kilmer, the son of Val Kilmer. Okay. I know this is 
really into him and there are there are many more and yeah. are there you know are there some israeli artists musicians that uh you recommend people in america listen to that that you know like charlie maybe unlike charlie we can appreciate while they're alive now yeah um yeah of course yeah there are some um some are not too uh, active but there are some that i can yeah um you know there are some bands that uh, go listen to like um, a band called love grenade love grenade uh to their first album that actually charlie magira was like the recording like the producer of that album we recorded it it's a really beautiful album it's like sort of a um, everything but you hear this um you know like you hear in phil spector the, the, the wow. early phil, the wall of sound so you hear that lo-fi bizarre wall of sound of charlie mcgear excellent well, well buzz is there anything else you would like to share with, with the viewers about yourself or the movie um i just just pay attention <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah, you one, one last question, and then I'll, I'll, I'll end it up. Um, what, what are you working on next? What's the next documentary you have going? Um, yeah, I had some. I had many ideas. Um, it probably will be will will be musical because I I checked all kinds of ideas that are not from the musical world. Like um, I had an idea idea about a a soccer team that I was into in the eighties that are now in like in the trying to get back to the premier league. Um, I had many ideas and I, I but I still didn't find the, the right, uh, the right one. I, I, I feel that it's really, really close and it will be a, a crazy musical uh, documentary. <laughs> Excellent. Well, congratulations again on this movie. Thanks Welcome. a lot. Thanks a lot, David.